Ron Holland has been hooked on sailing since he was a young lad. Today, when he wields a pencil at his drawing board, he is often designing cruising vessels or racing yachts for the rich and the famous. The wealthy ones who can afford a 247-foot yacht with six cabins, a master suite, some fluffy pillows, and lots of Veuve Clicquot on board, I bet. It is my pleasure to welcome world-class uh, designer and competitive sailor Ron Holland to Studio 4 to tell us more. And welcome to Vancouver. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Did you bring us a yacht? Yes. Good. Right, right outside here is one of my most important yachts. So hopefully your camera might go and look at that. That would be so great. In Coal Harbor? Yes. There she is. Yeah, this is a 186 foot sailing yacht built in Italy and it's owned by Larry Ellison. And they're cruising British Columbia. Do they invite you on board, or do they know you're here? Oh, uh, yeah, no, I, I know the captains of these boats really well, mm -hmm. so we try to keep track of our yachts, which are pretty well spread all over the world now. Yes. Who makes a good captain of a yacht that is uh, uh, 1,004 tons? Well, it's a, it's a whole new profession, this yacht captain. and the, In fact, the whole crewing thing is a profession. And uh, these are highly qualified people. And they need not only technical skills for sailing such a complex mm -hmm. vessel like these are, but they need social skills. So they sort of need to be a bit like a psychologist, dealing with the owner and the mm -hmm. other people on the boat. So it, it's a real profession. Well, and you, the designer, I'm sure have to be a bit of a psychologist. So someone comes to you and says to you, Ron, I happen to have 40, 50 million. My dream is to have a, a beautiful sloop few bedrooms, bathroom or two, uh, where do you start? Well, uh, that's a great call to get, by the way. <laughs> I'm and, sure. And, and in fact, those calls are a little bit less frequent in the last couple of years than they were previously. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the Mirabella project is a great example of, of what a client is trying to achieve, something unique. Joe Vittoria was the chairman of Avis mm -hmm. Rental Car Company, and he came to me and said, I want the biggest sloop in the world. I want it to have one mast, I want it to be built in fiberglass, and it's got to get into my dock in Palm Beach. Is that possible? Well, of course you say yes, but yes. then you try to figure mm -hmm. it out. Why fiberglass? He had previous boats, he's always had fiberglass boats. Mm -hmm. Traditionally you'd build a boat like Mirabella in aluminum or even steel, but uh, he just wanted the, the more high-tech aspect of doing a okay. lightweight, strong, fast sailing yacht. And is uh, Mr. Vittorio uh, a sailor himself or just loves uh, going on sailboats no, or what? he's an experienced sailor. Mm -hmm. In fact, he, he the first boat he had of mine was over 30 years ago. It was 33 feet long and he won the uh, Mediterranean Championship. So mm -hmm. we've just stayed in touch all these years. So he's hooked on you and I know that there's more than uh, nice teak paneling. Take me inside the Mirabella 5. Well, they're all unique. They're unique mm. to each owner. They vary wildly from traditional gentleman's club style to avant-garde minimalistic, which is becoming more popular yes. in these times. A little rock star. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I think the, an important aspect of this whole super yacht thing is that, you know, to reflect on the artisans that actually build these boats because they're, they're wild, very broad, complex things. Not only is the artisans building the interior, but the electronics and the engineering, they're very complex combinations of different disciplines. Is it the Mirabella that has um, a sort of garage? Very much so. Uh, one of the, uh, that's another thing he said, can I have this? Can I have a garage and on board? it's a 30-foot uh, Hinkley motor yacht that had to be stored inside mm. the stern of the boat. The one I can afford. That even Maybe even not. they're expensive. Oh, I <laughs> bet they are. Like, what's the price point? They're, that's a million dollar dinghy. Oh. A million dollar dinghy. That's over my budget, Ron. I know the feeling. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do. Uh, take me back to your beginnings. Uh, rumor has it you quit school. Yeah, the school thing didn't go very well. Uh, and it was... Uh, increased in a problem when I sailed at 15 from New Zealand to Australia with a friend. Mm. And to cross the ocean like that as a 15 year old was sort of a big deal. And I, 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 I don't remember my mother being particularly nervous, but she must have been. 
When I got back from that trip to Sydney, I had one more year to, of high school left. I wasn't interested. Yeah. So I went and did a boat building apprenticeship with a wooden boat builder mm. in New Zealand and uh, fell into the design side through that connection. And could you draw? Was it a natural thing for you? Where do you start? Yeah, it was a, it was a natural mm. thing. I think um, I come from design more from a kind of uh, artistic, natural side. The people that work for me today have all come from the university side. Mm -hmm. um, so I just did it uh, you know, with the love of the sport, love sure. of sailing. And, and you know, I reflect how as a kid sailing my little seven foot dinghy, I was imagining Captain Cook, Vancouver, right. and the great explorers. So I had this kind of image in my mind about sailing being connected to the exploration of the world. And that freedom. Was, yeah, that, that, that's been with me ever since. Sure, it's freedom and control, isn't it? Because you can make it go fast or slow, and depending on the wind. Yeah, and, but mm -hmm. it's, it's lovely that it, in such a complex age, we still have people that want to go sailing. And you can literally turn the engine off and blow along with the wind. And that's, that's something special, I think. Sure, something like the Mirabella 5, would it be a, a motor? I, I don't know if I have the terminology right, but like a motor yacht and a sailing yacht? Yes. So it's both? It's both. So you don't have to worry about no wind. Exactly. Or going about. And the uh, important thing is a lot of my clients have schedules. You know, they want to be there well, from A to B. Do. So they, they're not sitting around with no wind. They start motoring. And some have helicopters on board, do they? Not the sailing yachts because of the complexity of, you know, trying to land the thing right, with the rig. Right, that would be tough. <laughs> but, but our power yachts, yes. Mm -hmm. I know I was in San Bartz and, and I know you've been there many times for the regatta and I had the privilege of sailing from Antigua with the French crew. A Antigua to St. Bart's and uh, we were on a 76 foot beautiful marble hulled uh, boat called the Vivant. And we were like a dinghy in St. Bart's. I mean, it, beautiful, beautiful. And it was a racing yacht and it was gorgeous. But we were little yeah. compared to the rest of them in the harbor. It's really been a phenomena in the last 20 years, I would say, about this big super yacht business. Mm -hmm. um, the first 100 foot yacht I did was in uh, 1983. And that was considered an extraordinary project. Uh, 100 feet now is like you say, a small boat. And it's been, you know, it's linked to the whole, I think it's a, it's a the dot com boom. Okay. The financial freedom that that created for so many people hooked into the yachting thing. Mm -hmm. So now we're, we have, uh, now I have to say that in the last couple of years has been tough for the yachting industry because prior to that, there was probably 400 yachts building in the 150 to 200 foot size range four years ago. And that's mm -hmm. probably down to like 80 or 80 or less mm. now. Mm. So Subprime meltdown, uh, Greece. Uh, yeah, and, and also war. Uh, what? There's also a psychology to it because even if you can afford one of these yachts, do you really want to be seen doing it when you're laying mm. off people from your corporation? Okay. So that adds to uh, cautiousness. Sure. Good point. Now, how did you get from New Zealand to Ireland? I came through California. Of course. You I did. came on a cargo <laughs> ship and landed in San Francisco and. Uh, in 68 and went to work for a yacht designer called Gary Mullen in, in mm. San Francisco. And I spent 10 years doing design apprenticeships and professional sailing these yachts in the racing circuits around the world. And then uh, I had the opportunity uh, to design and build my first race yacht in 1973 and won the American Championship. Oh. The well, that's the a prize, big deal. Yeah, the prize was a free ship to England to compete in the World Championship. Mm. And I went to my boss, Charlie Morgan, that was Monday morning after the regatta and said, I've just won this thing, can I have a couple of weeks off? He said, no. <laughs> so I left him, went mm. to England and won the World Championship in 1974. What is the key to winning a World Championship, an America's Cup? Uh, obviously, it has something to do with the vessel a lot to do with the crew or what? Yeah, What's the, the balance? Uh, um, the America's Cup is the pinnacle of this because it, it's a complex thing. And I think the key is the leadership of an America's Cup campaign. Uh, Larry Ellison actually mm -hmm. is doing this now for, for the cup that will come to San Francisco Bay. Right. 
but it's to do with uh, uh, excellence in leadership. It's a very complicated, there's like three or 400 people involved at the pinnacle of an America's Cup campaign, and you need lots of money. Yes, it's true. But they give away good bags, <laughs> good sailing bags, <laughs> if you have the privilege. 